You asked for it, so here it is. A Pokemon Sword Hardcore Nuzlocke with only Fire-type Pokemon. I'll leave a full list of rules in the description, but the headlines are, if a Pokemon faints, it is gone and can't be used ever again. I only have one chance to catch a Pokemon per area, I can only use Fire-type Pokemon in battle, and I'll be making the game harder by enforcing level caps, playing on set mode, and not using any items from the bag in battle. Also, I'll limit my wild area encounters to one initial encounter and one additional encounter for each gym badge that I obtain. Since I've got the Sword DLC, I'll be including any Isle of Armor encounters in this limit as well. Let's get started. Leon gives me a choice of three Pokemon as my starter, and naturally, I pick the best starter, Grookey. Okay, so in my grass only Nuzlocke, the comments were packed with people arguing about who the best starter is, so I want to put it to vote and settle this madness once and for all. If you're a member of the Grookey gang, like the video, and then subscribe. If you're a fan of Score Bunny, subscribe and then like the video. And if Sobble is your favourite, stop it. Get some help. Cast your vote now. Okay, obviously I picked the fire type, Score Bunny. I gave it the nickname Harry Styles based on a suggestion from my Discord. If you'd like to join my Discord, check the description. My Score Bunny has a calm nature, which is really disappointing as this lowers its physical attack. Quick side note, I love how Score Bunny's tackle is just it running up to a Pokemon and kicking it. It looks so ineffective, but hilarious. Once the tutorials are out of the way, I have to take on Hop. I've only got Score Bunny, as there aren't any Fire-type Pokemon on the opening rounds. I'm outnumbered, but this isn't too much of a problem, as Hop's team has very little offense. Back in Wedgehurst, I grab a fiery outfit to match my fiery team. Now dressed for the part, Hop and I take the train, but have to depart at the wild area because a herd of Wulu are blocking the tracks. Really? We can't do anything about that? Okay then. In the wild area, I harvest a ton of berries, find the leftovers, grab a firestone, and find my first encounter, Volpix. I'm able to catch it and nickname it Kurama. My Volpix has a lonely nature, boosting its attack but lowering its physical defense. After exiting the wild area, I've made it to Motorstoke. Once here, Leon gives me a piece of charcoal, which is a really nice tool to have. Once the opening ceremony is out of the way, my gym challenge can finally begin. Hop wants another battle, but spoilers, he still sucks and Score Bunny is able to solo his team once again. After leveling my team a little, I've now got access to the next few routes and can add some extra Pokemon to my team. On Route 3, I'm able to find a Sizzlipede. It's a fire and bug type, and I give it the nickname Spicy Noodle. Unfortunately, it has a modest nature, which is far from ideal. After taking down the numerous trainers here, my Score Bunny reaches level 16 and evolves into Rabud. Next is the Galar Mine, where I'm able to catch a Roly Coly. It's a pure rock type for now, but it gains a secondary fire typing once it evolves at level 18. I bestow it the nickname Rock Bottom and continue moving through the mine. Just before the exit, Bede challenges me to a battle. He uses Psychic Pokemon, so I use my Sizzlipede as it knows bite. I easily remove Solosis and deal decent damage to Gothita. My attack stat was lowered though, so I decided to pivot into Vulpix. From here, Vulpix is able to finish Gothita and hangs on just long enough to incinerate Hatana. After exiting the mine, I make it to Route 4. Once the trainers are taken care of, I'm able to find and catch an Eevee. I immediately use my Firestone to evolve it into a Flareon and grant it the nickname Hot Dog. I've now made it to Turfield. While preparing for my first gym, I obtained an Expert Belt and trained my team to level 18. This allowed my Roly Coly to evolve into Carcol, who now has a Fire Typing. The Turfield gym puzzle requires me to round up some Wulu by chasing them. Hang on a minute. If Wulu were this easy to move around, why couldn't we just chase them away when they were blocking the train tracks earlier? Anyway, the gym leader uses grass type Pokemon, so let's burn this gym down. I lead with Sizzlipede, who has a 4 times resistance to grass moves. Milo's Glossifluor falls with two flame wheels. His last Pokemon is Elder Gloss, and we both Dynamax, transforming my Sizzlipede into an extra large spicy noodle. I tank a Max Strike and finish Elder Gloss with a second Max Flare on the next turn. It's an easy fight and gives me my very first badge. On Route 5, Hop still hasn't learnt his lesson and wants a rematch. 
Fortunately for me, Hop's team has very little offense against Karkol, so I'm easily able to sweep with a mixture of Flame Charge and Ancient Power. I've now made it to Holbury. I can take on the second gym right away, however, I'm not quite ready yet. This gym uses Water-type Pokemon, which is really threatening, so I'll need to be prepared. In search of my next encounter, I decided to head to the Isle of Armor. Uh, are you okay? Why are you standing like that? The levels of the wild Pokemon in the Isle of Armor scale with the player, so I'm able to explore this area without taking too many risks. In the warm-up tunnel, I'm able to find and catch a Torkoal, which I nicknamed Ra. It has the Drought ability, which sets up a harsh sunlight when it's sent into battle. I'm also able to find a second Firestone, and use this on Vulpix to evolve it into a Ninetales. I then spent a long time collecting items and improving the movesets of my team to prepare for the next gym. Ness's team boasts three water Pokemon, and her ace, Dreadnought, has a secondary rock type. This gives it a four times resistance to my fire moves. My plan is to leap with Raboot and use Electro Ball to flush Goldeen. I managed to take it down immediately thanks to a critical hit, however, this wasn't overly needed. Next is Aracuda. I decide to switch into Torkoal, which sets up the sun, reducing the power of water moves considerably. I then switch into Ninetales and use Nasty Plot twice to give me a huge special attack increase. From here, a single energy ball is enough to finish Aracuda. Last is Dreadnor, and we both Dynamax. My boosted special attack and Dreadnor's 4 times weakness to grass lets me finish it off with one max overgrowth. I have no clue why Ninetales can learn energy ball, but boy am I glad that it can. That's badge number 2. In the Galar Mine, Bede wants a rematch, but I'm able to wipe that smug grin off his face with my Sizzlipede, who cleans up Bede's team with some expert belt boosted bug bites. Say that 5 times quickly. This mine is horrifying, I stepped in a bear trap. Forget the gym challenge, get me out of here while my feet are still attached to the rest of my body. After exiting that godforsaken mine, I return to Motorstoke to take on the third gym. This gym challenge gives you the opportunity to catch Pokemon, and as these are fire types, I'm able to get an encounter. The first new Pokemon that I find is a Litwick. I'm fortunately able to catch it before the gym trainer has a chance to knock it out. I give it the nickname Bunsen, and place it in my PC for now. After clearing the challenge, it's time to take on Kabu, a fellow user of fire type Pokemon. I lead with Raboot, as I'm trying to bait Kabu into using a fire type attack as I switch into Karkol. Unfortunately, he doesn't fall for it and only wants to use Quick Attack. Ninetales can't do anything against Karkol, so I use Rapid Spin several times to boost my speed. From here, an Ancient Power easily removes Ninetales. Next is Arcanine, but it too struggles to damage Karkol and falls to a few Smackdowns. Last is Center Scorch. It's a great matchup for me, as I'm able to outspeed and hit with a 4 times effective Max Rockfall. I crushed that bug in one turn, three badges down. With Kabu embarrassed in front of a full stadium, I'd asserted myself as the strongest fire type user. To rub it in, I literally stole Kabu's clothes in an act of dominance. My next stop is Hammerlock, but to get there, I'll need to navigate through the northern portion of the wild area. Some of the Pokemon here are much stronger than me, so I'll need to be cautious and enforce some strict social distancing. Having made it through safely, I can now enter Hammerlock. There are a few interesting items that I can grab here. First, I obtain a Heat Rock and give it to my Torkoal. This will extend the duration of Harsh Sunlight and combos nicely with Torkoal's Drought ability. I then travel to this house and pummel this guy's level 2 Cottony. As a reward for the sheer brutalization I just committed, I'm given a Focus Sash. Rose teaches us the shocking secrets of how electricity works, but once that's taken care of, I can travel west onto Route 6. While battling, Sizzlapee reached level 28 and evolved into a Center Scorch. I'm also able to find and catch a Heat Maw, which I nicknamed Slurp. It has a neutral nature and decent offensive stats, but I'll be leaving it to collect dust in the PC. At the end of the route, I had a really close call with this Sudowoodo. That was nearly the end of Ninetales. Having just scraped by, I stopped to pay my respects to our Lord and Savior, Diglett. I've now made it to Stolen Side, and Hop is looking for a rematch with his new team. I lead with Raboot and use a 4 times effective Electro Ball, which surprisingly doesn't finish Cremorant. Hop uses Dive, so I pivot into Torkoal as my huge defense and harsh sunlight will let me tank the dive. 
Kramer uses Dive and oh my god, what on earth, it's eating Pikachu! One Lava Plume finishes Cramorant, but it spits out the Pikachu at me and paralyzes me? I thought that crazy shenanigans like this only happened in the Pokemon anime. What's worse is that we're battling on dirt, so did Cramorant find a deceased Pikachu that had been buried? Whether it's cannibalism or grave robbing, this is messed up no matter how you spin it. With my health low, I decide to switch into Ninetales. Silicobra digs, so I use this opportunity to set up Nasty Plot and manage to live the dig. From here, my boosted Ninetales can easily sweep the rest of Hop's team. Next item on the agenda is the Stone Side Gym. B uses 4 fighting type Pokemon and I'm a little underleveled, so I decided to take some time to prepare. While leveling, Karkol evolved into Colossal and Raboot evolved into Cinderace. I decided to keep my team composition the same. While you might think that Litwick would do well in this gym due to its ghost typing, most of B's Pokemon have dark coverage, so Litwick's inclusion isn't as good as it might seem. B's lead is a Hitmontop with 4 physical moves, so my plan revolves around using this to my advantage. I lead with Flareon and use Will-O-Wisp to burn Hitmontop. This will do chip damage, but more importantly, halves Hitmontop's physical damage output. I then use Charm 3 times to nerf Hitmontop's attack into the ground. I then switch into Torkoal for a single turn which sets up the sun. Next, I pivot into Ninetales and begin buffing my special attack with Nasty Plot. Hitmontop does such small damage at this point, and my leftovers keeps me at full health. Once my special attack is maxed, the rest of the fight is a clean sweep. Too easy, that's the fourth badge. Soon after, there's another battle with Bead, but you know the drill. Spicy Noodle bug bites all over him for an easy sweep. Into the Glimwood Tangle. There aren't any encounters for me here, but I am able to find the U-Turn TM, which I teach to Cinderace. I then reached Bolomnia and am given a Choice Scarf and an Eviolite. There isn't much else to do here, so it's time to take on the next gym. Opal uses Fairy types, so I decided to search for a new encounter to help me out. Over on the Isle of Armor, I managed to catch a Salandit, which I nicknamed Salandazard. It's a Fire and Poison type, so it should be useful for the next gym. Unfortunately, the one I found was a male, so it won't be able to evolve, but I can use this to my benefit and give it the Eviolite to increase its bulk. For the upcoming gym, I decided to sideline my Cinderace to make room for Salandit. Opal uses Fairy types, but the dual types of her first two Pokemon make Ninetales my best lead. I use one Nasty Plot to buff my special attack. I'm poisoned in the process, but this isn't too much of a problem, and I take Weezing down with extra sensory on the next turn. Opal then sends out Togekiss, so I switch into Salandit. Ancient Power does much more damage than I expect though, so I switch once more into my Colossal. It leaves Ancient Power much more comfortably, and with the help of my Citrus Berry, I'm able to land 3 heavy slams to take Togekiss down. Next is Morwile. I switch into Torkoal, setting up the Sun. My bulk lets me easily live a crunch, and one Sun boosted Lava Plume is enough to finish Morwile. Opal's last Pokemon is Alcremie. I want to stall out the Dynamax turns as much as possible, so I also max my Torkoal and use Max Guard. On the next turn, I use Max Flare which does a large chunk of damage. I'm in crit range, so I use one more Max Guard and both of our Dynamaxes end. From here, I switch into Flareon and finish Alcremie with a Fire Fang. It was a little messy, but with that, I've now got 5 badges. Even with the Eviolite, Salandit is just too frail, so I decided to switch it back out for Cinderace. Back in Hammerlock, I witnessed Opal completely creeping on Bead. She drags Bead back to her scary forest and we may never see him again. The routes to the east are now open and the masochist Hop wants another beatdown. This fight doesn't pose much of a challenge and I easily take care of Hop's team. Routes 7 and 8 don't offer me any new encounters, so I quickly move through them with the occasional pause for pedestrians. Soon after, I'd reached the winter wonderland of Sir Chester City, but don't let the weather fool you. Unlike in Pokemon Shield, the gym leader uses rock Pokemon, a type that every member of my team is weak to. Gordy's lead has a rock and water typing, so I lead with nine tails and quickly take it down with a four times effective energy ball. Next is Shuckle, who has about as much offense as a light breeze. I'll be taking advantage of this and first switch into Colossal. I then use Reflect, and this will last for 8 turns as I'm holding the Light Clay. 
I then switch into Torkoal. I begin using Iron Defense to increase my bulk. This, combined with my Reflect and Leftovers, means that Shuckle can barely touch me. Once my defense is maxed out, it's time to reintroduce an old favorite of mine, Body Press. If you've seen my Mono Grass video, then you'd know this move very well already, but if you haven't, the power of Body Press increases based on the user's defense. With my defense maxed, I can easily tank Gordy's physical moves and deal enormous damage with Body Press. This allows my Sun God Turtle to sweep Gordy's team in a few turns. With that, the sixth badge is mine. After embarrassing Hop once more, I head south through Route 9 before reaching Spikemouth. Once here, I need to take on Marnie, but it's a pretty underwhelming fight, so let's move on. The Spikemouth gym is wild. People are jumping out of windows, flipping, and I ran into Ash Ketchum's dad, which is a nice little easter egg. The gym leader, Piers, uses dark type Pokemon, and his team has some diverse secondary typings which prevent him from being too exploitable. His lead is a physical Scrafty, so my plan is to use the same strategy that I did for the last gym. I lead Colossal and set up Reflect. I then pivot into Torkoal and begin boosting my physical bulk with Iron Defense. Scrafty's Brick Break removes my Reflect, however I'm still able to max my defense without taking too much damage. From here, one Body Press is enough to take it down. The rest of Piers' team doesn't have enough offense to handle my Torkoal, and I sweep the rest of his team into the trash. I've now got my 7th badge, and the run has been very clean so far without a single death. After the battle, I made my way back towards Hammerlock to challenge the final gym. This gym terrifies me. While Raihan is labelled as a dragon user, a closer look at his team reveals that it's really more of a sandstorm team. His typing is primarily ground, dragon, and rock, three types which fire does not do well against. To make matters worse, this is a double battle, which increases the danger and uncertainty that I'll be facing. It's no exaggeration to say that this is easily the hardest gym for my team. I needed a plan. To prepare, I leveled my Litwick, which allowed it to evolve into a Lampant. One Duskstone later, and it evolved again into a Chandelure. I've decided to bench Center Scorch for now, as it has a 4 times weakness to Rock, which will really limit its use in this battle. Next, I hunted Morwile, which has a 5% chance to be holding an Iron Ball. On my 17th try, I eventually found one and used Thief to seize it. Finally, I backtracked to Turfield, where I can use my upgraded bike to grab the Solar Beam TM. Raihan leads with Gigalith and Flygon. Gigalith is bad news. It has an enormous physical attack and defense. Furthermore, its ability sets up a Sandstorm, which boosts its special defense. It also has powerful attacks that will hit me for super effective damage. With this in mind, my plan is centered on countering Gigalith. I'm leading with Torkoal and Chandelure. I've given Torkoal the Iron Ball, which halves its speed. This means that my Drought will override the Sandstorm set up by Gigalith. Not only does this reduce Gigalith's special bulk, it also lets me use Chandelure's huge special attack to fire off a Solar Beam free of charge and take Gigalith down immediately. Flygon can do decent damage, but isn't too threatening. I decide to use Will-O-Wisp to burn Flygon, lowering its damage output and allowing me to focus on the other slot. Next is Sandaconda, who I'm also able to remove with a Solar Beam. Its ability reinstates the sand, but that's not too bad now that Gigalith is no longer a problem. With Torkoal, I then use Iron Defense to help survive Raihan's physical attacks. His last Pokemon is Duraludon, which is Dynamaxed. I don't want to risk losing Chandelure, so I switch into Colossal and try to land a burn with Torkoal onto Duraludon. This works in my favor, and I easily tank Raihan's attacks. I Dynamax Colossal and go for a max Rockfall onto Flygon and a Body Press onto Duraludon. These do decent damage, but not enough to pick up a KO. I go for the same moves the next turn. I'm outsped, but my bulk allows me to tank multiple hits, and another Body Press finishes Duraludon. With only Flygon left, I switch out my weak Torkoal, and a final max Rockfall allows me to finish the fight, securing the win and my 8th badge. A short train ride brought me to Route 10. As has been the case with most of this run, I was expecting to breeze through this route, but then I met Cabby Jeffrey. His lead is a Corviknight, which isn't too much trouble, but it's his second and final Pokemon that needs to be addressed. Meet Flygon. Unlike Raihan's Flygon, this one actually has Earthquake, a move that cripples my whole team and I don't have much offense to answer with. I struggled as my team was ripped to pieces. I lost Flareon, Ninetales, 
and Colossal in the process of taking it down. Just like that, three staples of my team, who had been with me since the very beginning had fallen, in the event that would now be known as the Slaughter on White Hill. Hot Dog, Kuruma, and Rock Bottom, rest easy friends. Fortunately, I did have plenty of wild area encounters left to help me rebuild. I was able to add a few new members to the team, including a Growlithe, which I nicknamed Sniffer, a Fletchinder named Phoenix, and a Larvastar named Lyder. While bringing the new members of my team up to speed, Fletchinder evolved into a Talonflame, and I used a Firestone to evolve Growlithe into Arcanine. With my new look team, I then headed back up the mountain, paying my respects along the way. A short time later, I'd made it to Winden. This will be the stage for the final portion of the challenge. The next two battles are against Marnie and Hop. If you've seen my Mono Grass Shield Nuzlocke, you'd know that their teams are almost entirely physical attackers. And what do we do with physical attackers? <coughs> Setting up on Marnie can be a little tricky, as her Lipard has Nasty Plot and Snarl, which can do big damage to Torkoal. I make sure to not be greedy, and use Iron Defense only once before taking it down with a 4 times effective Body Press. Next is Scrafty, who I use to bring my defense to plus 5. I've also got the leftovers, and this helps me recover some of the health that I lost earlier. With my defense sky high, one body press finishes Scrafty. Toxic Rogue is a little difficult as it knows Venishock and Toxic, as well as resists body press. I can't take it out in one shot and take big damage from Venishock. I'm able to finish the job with a second body press, however, Torkoal's health is getting low. More Peko has little offensive options against Torkoal, so I decide to stay in and finish it with a body press. Last is a Dynamax Grimmsnarl. It's a physical attacker, but has some strong moves. There's a big build up, as Marnie uses a move that she's been training really hard to use. And it does a whopping 19 damage. Keep training Marnie, you'll get there. I'm paralyzed on the first turn, and do some big damage on the second. Torkoal is really low now, so I switch into Arcanine, which lets an Intimidate off and comfortably tanks a hit. With Marnie's Dynamax now ended, Arcanine finishes the fight with an extreme speed. My next fight is with Hop. If you're a fan of Hop, look away now because it's not pretty. Fight! Too easy. For plot reasons, I now need to take on the Vice President of Macrocosmos, Oleana. Her team is quite diverse, and this battle can't be taken lightly. Her lead is a Frostlass, so I go with Arcanine and manage to land a Flamethrower through Double Team, taking it down in one shot. Next is Milotic, which is a real threat given its bulk and water typing. I switch into Torkoal to set up the Sun, reducing the power of water moves. I then switch once more into Chandelure. Thanks to the Sun, I comfortably live a Surf and can use Solar Beam without needing to charge. Solar Beam is a 2-hit kill, but I'm eventually able to finish Milotic after it stalls with Recover. Against Salazzle, I switch into Arcanine, who can tank special moves thanks to its Assault Vest. On the next turn, I use Dig, which hits for 4 times effective damage, and this buries Salazzle. Serena doesn't pose too much of a threat, so I switch into Torkoal and take it down with a Sun-boosted Lava Plume. Last is a Dynamax Garbodor, and it's really threatening due to it having both a Rock and Ground Attack, giving it coverage against my whole team. My plan is to stall out the Dynamax. I stay in with Torkoal, who barely lives a max Rockfall, and manages to land a Will-O-Wisp. As Garbodor is a physical attacker, this reduces its damage output. I then pivot into Arcanine, which nerfs Garbodor even further thanks to Intimidate. On the next turn, I switch into Cinderace to stall out the final turn of Oleana's Dynamax. From here, I use my Dynamax to finish Garbodor on the next turn. With Oleana taken care of, I can now return to the Champion's Cup. Or maybe not. I'm interrupted by Bede, who's doing his best impression of a marshmallow swirl and wants to battle with his pretty pink Pokemon. While this battle wasn't easy, I was able to get by by simply spamming some sun-boosted fire moves. With the marshmallow now roasted, I can move on to the remainder of the Champion's Cup. The next stage will see me rematch against three gym leaders, Nessa, B, and Raihan. Nessa's water-focused team is obviously troubling for my fire types. My strategy for the fight is to set up Sun and sweep with Chandelure's Solar Beam. However, this won't be easy as Nessa has a Drizzle Pelipper in the back which will change the weather to rain. 
Against Gar, Lis, iPod, I lead with Talonflame. I use Acrobatics, which I know won't be enough to kill, however, it does do more than 50%, which forces Go, Lis, Op, Odd to switch out due to its ability. This brings Barraskudo out, who hits like a truck, so I switch into Torkoal, who can tank its hits by setting up the sun. With the sun now up, I'm confident in switching into Cinderace. I take big damage from a drill run, and won't survive another, but I decide to get around this by Dynamaxing. This gives me a health increase, which allows me to just survive another drill run. I then land a Max Lightning to finish Barraskudo. G, Ollie, Sapod returns, but I outspeed and finish it off in one shot. Next is Seeking, but it doesn't have much bulk, so it too falls to a Max Lightning. Pelipper is sent out just as my Dynamax ends. I could take Pelipper down with Cinderace, but need to override the rain, so I switch into Torkoal. With the sun restored, I'm clear to switch into Chandelure. Pelipper uses Tailwind, giving it a speed boost. My Solar Beam can't finish Pelipper in one turn, and Nessa recovers. Honestly, this worked out great for me, as Tailwind expired just as I was able to finally finish Pelipper. Furthermore, since my Torkoal was holding the Heat Rock, I still have a few turns of Sun left as Nessa sends out her final Pokemon, Dreadnor. It Dynamaxed, but my Chandelure can fire off a 4 times effective Solar Beam to defeat Dreadnor before it even has a chance to move. Next is the Fighting type user, B, but this battle isn't as close as the last one. How Lucha is her lead, and is also the biggest threat to my team. I lead with Arcanine to let off an Intimidate, and my Choice Scarf allows me to outspeed and land a Flamethrower, removing just over half of its health. Fortunately, Hal Lucha missed its high jump kick, which took the remainder of its health. Phalanx has access to Rock Tomb, but it doesn't pose much of a threat. Two Flamethrowers finishes it off. Next is Grappleocked, and this is where Chandelure takes over. Grappleocked has no moves that can hit me due to my Ghost Typing. This lets me switch in for free, and take it down with a Choice Specs boosted Psychic. Surfetched suffers the same fate on the next turn. Last is Machamp, but it too has no moves that can hit me due to my Ghost Type and Flash Fire ability. B's helpless, as I Mind Crush her Machamp in two turns to finish the fight. Too easy. My final bracket match is against Raihan. Honestly, his team is less threatening than before, as there's no real synergy. Despite that, his Flygon and Duraludon are huge threats due to their monster attack stats and good coverage for dealing with my team. Fortunately, I've got a strategy to make this fight a little easier. Against Torkoal, I lead with Talonflame who is holding a Lumberry. Torkoal can't do too much damage, so I use Swords Dance to boost my attack by 4 stages. Torkoal puts me to sleep, however my Lumberry wakes me up. As I'm no longer holding an item, I use Acrobatics which has its power doubled. But Torkoal still lived and used Yawn again. I don't want to take Torkoal out as I fall asleep, so I use Sword Stance to max my attack and simply hope that I can wake up before Torkoal finishes me off. On turn 1, I slept. On turn 2, I slept. On turn 3, I slept. And on turn 4, I took the chance and woke up just in time. I landed an Acrobatics which removed Torkoal in one shot. From here, I outspeed Raihan's team, and my enormous attack lets me finish all of his Pokemon in one shot. I've got to say, ripping that Flygon apart felt pretty good after having my team decimated by the Flygon on Route 10. Continuing the trend of interruptions, Rose executes his Doomsday plan just as I'm about to battle Leon. Uninterested in the chaos around us, Hop and I go looking for some dogs in the forest, but only manage to find some antiques. I then returned to the scene of the crime, and need to take on Rose in a battle. Thing is, his team is made up of steel types, and I'm sure you know how this goes. Hit the music. I took his steel Pokemon, melted them down with Flamethrower, and reshaped them into a nice big L for Rose to hold. You keep that as a souvenir, pal. Anyway, Rose has unleashed this dreadful looking creature. It's our job to send it back from the fiery depths from which it came. To help with this, our antiques turned into dogs. I let everyone else do the heavy lifting, and cowardly use Dig to keep my Arcanine out of harm's way. Eventually, we take it down and the day is saved. There's only one thing left to do, and that's to take on the champion, Leon. While getting ready, I caught a Rotom and converted it into an oven. This will help me heat up my food, and maybe I can find some use for it on my team. After taking some time to strategize and level my team, I was ready for Leon. 
Leon's team is scary due to its diverse typings and its stacked full of powerful Pokemon. I doubt that my fire type can use brute force to run over his team, so I've had to think carefully about my approach in this battle. Leon leads with Aegislash, a mixed attacker. I send out Rotom, who I've taught Eerie Impulse, which reduces the opponent's special attack by two stages. I land this move twice, nullifying its special moves. Aegislash uses its physical move, Sacred Sword, and lands a critical hit. I can land a third Eerie Impulse, but sadly, due to the crit, I can't survive another attack, and Rotom falls. Next, I send in Torkoal and use Will-O-Wisp. This halves Aegislash physical damage output, meaning that I've now completely nerfed its offense. I then switch into Talonflame and begin boosting my attack with Sword Stance. Once maxed, I use Tailwind to boost my speed for the next few turns. The timing works out well, as on this turn, Aegislash does enough damage to trigger my Citrus Berry. From here, my setup is perfect, and I remove Aegislash on the next turn with Flame Charge. Dragapult falls to Acrobatics. Mr. Rhyme is roasted by Flame Charge. Inteleon is crushed by Acrobatics. As is Haxorus. Leon's last Pokemon is Charizard. A Dynamaxes, and an Aerobatics falls just short of taking it down. Charizard then uses Max Rockfall, which crushes my Talonflame. I then send out Cinderace, my starter Pokemon who's been with me from the very beginning. Leon heals, and I Dynamax. I use Max Lightning, but this removes about 40% of Charizard's health. On the next turn, I use Max Guard, which stores out Leon's last Dynamax turn. With Charizard now much smaller, and less bulky, one final Max Lightning is enough to finish the fight. With that, my team of Fire Pokemon had conquered the Galar region under Hardcore Nuzlocke rules. This run had a lot of ups, some downs, and honestly, a lot of close calls. The Fire type is one of my favorites, and I think that I've been able to demonstrate some of the awesome Fire types in this run. I was also impressed by how good Score Bunny was, considering it had a bad nature. Maybe it's not so bad after all. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe, as it's free and really helps me out. In the comments, let me know who your MVP of the run was and why. Until next time, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.